Okay, welcome back guys. So uh, we left off last time doing sort of a review or an overview of what a close reading is. And sometimes we're going to need to do a little bit of background work to do a proper close reading of a text because there are there are situations where you know we do need at times to know about the author okay we we can't necessarily get into the text as clearly if we don't know a little bit about the author or for example things like you know the genre we, we might need to know a little bit about the origins and the history of a genre to better understand a text, okay? What we also want to be careful of is, um, you know, our analysis and interpretation. We don't want to necessarily read our ideas from our modern culture or from our particular cultural situation into the text. So not every interpretation is valid. All right. So it's not how we just feel about the text. So just want to make a note about this. Okay. Not every idea or interpretation is valid. Well, you say why, Mr. Kinsella? Because it's not about just what you feel, okay? It's not like, oh, I feel this way in my heart, so therefore, you know, that's what I think is here in the text. You can have a valid emotional experience with the text that can inform your interpretation, it can influence your interpretation, but ultimately, to prove a point, to make an argument, about the text, you need to find something in the text to support your interpretation or your argument. Okay, so in a sense, our analysis and our interpretation of the text must be supported with evidence from the text. Okay, if we don't have this evidence, that's a problem. And that evidence has to be consistent. Okay, has to be consistent evidence. Okay, you're like a lawyer, you know, trying to prove a point here from the text you have to have valid evidence so I'll give you an example um, there was a, a story called the yellow wallpaper and it's a feminist text and it's you know written by an American woman who was writing from a feminist perspective, so it was pro-feminist, and I believe it's late 1800s that it was written, or early 1900s, I can't quite remember the exact date at the moment. And in this story, a woman who doesn't feel well and is suffering from depression, perhaps postpartum depression after having a baby, her husband, who's a doctor, forces her to stay in a certain room in this sort of vacation house, and he doesn't want her to do anything. Don't write anything. Don't write stories. Don't write in your journal. Just do nothing, basically. And it's making her sicker and more depressed, actually. So it's about kind of male oppression of women. Now, she does happen to stay up late at night, though, and she becomes obsessed with the wallpaper in the room. And she starts seeing, like, figures crawling around in the wallpaper, and she starts peeling the wallpaper, trying to free uh, people from behind these kind of bars that she sees, you know, like, 
kind of people behind the bars. Women, actually, she sees be behind these bars in the wallpaper, and she starts trying to free them and release them. Okay? Now, there's sort of a night and a day alternating. And during the night, that that's when the woman kind of experiences freedom and during the day the man you know oppresses um, so anyway a certain student you know they took this idea of night and day and they thought um, you know the the day represents f female freedom because that's when she's not bothered by anything and the night represented you know male dominance and this particular student happened to be from china and in china the sun is uh, seen as female and the moon is seen as male well that's actually the opposite of the general use of those symbols in American context. The sun is usually masculine and the moon is usually feminine. And there's reasons for that. But what's my point? My point is that they took their cultural view here and they said, oh, that means like this. Okay. The problem with that is it doesn't match the, the authors point of view and so we can't just say whatever we want about any text and think that that is the meaning so unfortunately this didn't work because it wasn't supported by the evidence internally inside the text so we got to be very careful about that when we're doing close readings okay now uh, so that's sort of close reading in a nutshell. Next, I just want to point out some features of poems and ways to talk about um, the structures and the aspects of poems. Because uh, there's some different terminology that we need to use when we're talking about poetry. Okay, so a poem internally has a speaker. Okay, the speaker of the poem is the one speaking. So a speaker is similar to a narrator. Right? If you think of a narrator of a of a story, it when you're in a poem, you call that person as a character they're a character inside the poem and they are speaking they're talking to the reader right so you have a, a speaker we have to be careful to never equate the speaker with the author the speaker is not the author the speaker is a character that the author has created. They may be similar to the author. They may express things that the author is expressing, but we can't say they are exactly identical to the author. Because the speaker is a creation of the author. Okay. So we have a speaker who is a character inside the poem right poems also structurally they're made up of lines okay not sentences they have lines not sentences so we don't speak of sentences in poems we speak of lines so for example uh, if we think of a type of poem let's choose uh, sonnet uh, very common 
Elizabethan or Shakespearean sonnet has 14 lines. So we've got to have 14 lines total. The last two lines rhyme together. And when there's two lines that follow each other right after, like line by line, back to back lines that rhyme, that have the same end sound, that's called a rhyming couplet. So a sonnet has to have this very strict structure. Okay. We can, you know, get into different rhyme schemes and patterns and things. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 13, 14. 14 lines. And there will have a rhyme pattern. So you, you can watch the supplemental videos on elements of, of poetry um, and you can hear about different times of rhyme schemes and meter and so on. Um, so there are rhyme patterns and we call those schemes. Okay, a scheme is a pattern. In this case, in this 14-line poem, if it's an Elizabethan sonnet, it's got to go A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then the last two lines are G, G. And that refers to the sound of the last word. So the rhyme, in this case, is an end rhyme. That's the sound of the last word. So if the last word, you know, for A is day, last word for B is, say, gloom, A again, will be say, and B would be doom. So gloom and doom, say and day. They have the same sound, right? Those rhyme together. So that's what it's referring to for the end rhyme. So we refer to the lines in a poem as lines, okay? And we do not call them sentences, and then if there are chunks of a poem, let's see if this will paste, I think I've got something ready for us. Let's see if I can paste that. Well, it sort of worked. Um, so here's an example of a poem by Dylan Thomas, a famous poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And you see you've got chunks here, right? There's one, two, three, four, five, six chunks. Well, we, we're not going to call these paragraphs in a poem. In a poem, they're called stanzas. Okay, it's like a paragraph, but we don't call it a paragraph in a, in a poem. It's similar, but they're called stanzas. Okay, so in this case, I have six stanzas. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So we can see here, those rhyme, and day has a different sound. It doesn't rhyme. Okay, the wise men at their end, no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they... Do not go gentle into that good night. So notice day and they and right and night. That's a rhyme pattern there.
Okay, so just basics of poems.